It's very difficult for me to make up my mind what to say to such a distinguished audience as this. Both the town and the gown are well represented here. Both the theologian and the sociologist. Both the Democrat and the Republican. Uh, well, there are some left. And uh, the liberal and the conservative. That's what they call them today. I don't know if you have any of those odd human beings here present, as we had when I went to school. We had three sectors. The liberal, the conservative, and in our school, both at Oxford and Toronto, we had the normalist. The normalist. A little bit different. But I brought something with me today that I care not to read in full. It's something that you should know, something you should read, something that all the priests already have studied. It's an excerpt from Cardinal Newman's idea of a university. And the title of it on page 61 of his idea is The Nature of God. The Forgotten Theology. And incidentally, it goes on to suggest, if not say, in many words, that there is such a thing as religion. You will read this most beautiful part of English prose written. I'm a humanite, of course. No one ever wielded a pen in any language save Voltaire in French, comparable to this man. And if you have a gentleman here in charge of this affair, he can take this and have it duplicated for all the rest. Give it to somebody. And so something now about the nature of God. God is an infinite substance, so we say in theology. Period. Now some persons are going to say God is a person. It's like saying man is a being with two legs. Because God is not a person only. He happens to be three persons in one God. But God has no limitation to what he has and what he has. For your own knowledge in metaphysics, especially in the science of psychological metaphysics. You know, the highest concept the human intellect can achieve is the concept of persona. When we get that high, we've hit ceiling. We can't think higher than that. <laughs> oh, we have a finite idea of the infinite, so we're told, whatever jargon that is. It's jargon, that's all it is. This concludes. But we have, more or less, the complete human creature concept of persona. A persona is a being gifted with intellect and will, <laughs> responsible for his own actions. That's the best losing definition that we have. Intellect and will and responsible for the own A being, I said, I didn't say human being. Because we are the lowest grade of person God has created. 
just the same as the virus might be the lowest form of animocular that he created in the animal world. We are, as human beings, the lowest grade of persona that he has created in the intellectual world, the spiritual world. Now, don't try to limit God and say he's only a person or three persons. Don't try to say that. Don't try to fence him in, as an old Americanism. Don't try to define him. To limit him. He's an infinite substance, always was and always will be. He's an all-powerful substance, all-knowing substance, all-good substance, all-everything, as human most beautifully puts it in this excerpt that I'm asking you to quiet. In fact, that should be must reading in every first year college English, almost memorized. God, of course, is not material because matter wears out and matter begins. Whatever wears out must begin. Whatever disintegrates certainly lacks infinity. The nature of God, as you go to school, you young gentlemen, you young ladies in college, discover in metaphysics that there are the four metaphysical entities upon which everything else exists. Omni ends at bonum. Everything's good. Omni ends at fulcrum. Everything is beautiful. Omni ends at unum. Everything is uniform. Those three, and then the order. Goodness. We'll take the one item of goodness. Infinitely good. What's the word good mean? You have a good automobile because every part concurrently works together. It doesn't stall on the street. You have a good person. His intellect, his will, his imagination, his memory, his emotions, his passion. His corpus all harmonizes together, integrated, works beautifully. Good. What do we mean by goodness? Because God is good, says Cardinal Mercier in his work on this subject, it pertains to his nature to give. To give. To give what? To give existence is the first thing to everything he created. How long has God been creating? How long has God been giving? Now that's the question for the philosophy. How long is eternity? From all eternity, God has been creating. Creating what? That stupendous thought so far above us we can't encompass it. We don't know. Creating materia? We don't know. Creating persona? We don't know. But by the very nature of God, insofar as he is infinitely good, always he has been creating. Ah, there's another point to it, though. Creating for the future, as he did Christ to be born at a given time, or 
creating totally from all eternity. It's another thought for the metaphysician. But he has been created. Creating Earth, creating material world, creating planets, stars, galaxies. 186,000 miles a second, so we're told, I, I take it for granted that it's right for light sound. From all eternity, the light could have been shining from the beginning of God down to this planet that day and still will not have arrived. To lighten the subject just a little bit, you know, we're trying to gain access to Venus and Mars and Jupiter and the planet. We're going to other space, we're going to other planets after we have proven to ourselves that we can't manage the one on which we live. The nature of God is stupendous. It's above our comprehension because it's infinite, and here we have a finite mind trying to encompass the infinite. Well, we could go on making that subject at length. I know that you have to be home to lunch. I'm going to get off that interesting subject, the most interesting subject in all philosophy, in all theology, in all science. The science that deals with terrestrial physics might be interesting to you, but who knows the answer to this question? Do the principles of whole force in terrestrial physics, the principle of gravitation, for example, Hold forth in celestial physics. Don't say yes, don't say no. Be honest and say you don't know. Do any of the principles here of hydrogen or oxygen and its admixture into water, do they hold good? Be honest, you don't know. Always remember in your humility and my humility, we're about bottomless creation of God in the kingdom of persona. We do know that just as it is a gradation in the animal life from the virus all the way up to the man, very likely, I didn't say positively, but very likely there's another gradation in the whole persona rising gradually, 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 hundreds of millions of billions of trillions of quadrillions of species beyond in persona. From the lowest little spirit persona no body, called an angel. To the highest persona, of those who confer the God, how many predictions there are. How many predictions there are. Uncomfortable from all eternity. You think poetry is interesting? You think to sit down and see these Italian producers portray for us Barabbas, that wonderful read? You get yourself caught in this speculation of God and his goodness, God and his creation, goodness and his creation. Get yourself caught in the midst of that. It's the most romantic speculation and intelligent activity in which man can become interested. <coughs> in fact, it's heaven. That is heaven. 
to have all these accidents and obstructions and corporeality and materiality totally dissolved. There standing full panoply does God created you, intellect to know, will to love, the dim-mass eternal part of the God. But how do we know what God is, though, from a more practical viewpoint? Long before books were printed, long before men began to carve their history upon the rock, God had written the story of God in the skies, and the mountains, the rivers, and the lakes. He had written the story of God in the smile of a baby cuddled in your arms. He had written the story of God in a little robin's egg that he God had written in this great mirror of nature something of God that even a child could grasp. The beauty of the sunrise and sunset. The magnificence of the towering beach of the mountain. The babbling brook in its innocence. The little primrose smiling out of the depth of the snow. God had written, I'm beautiful, see the beauty that I've created. I'm powerful, see the mountain I've stored up for you. I'm good, see the mother nursing her child. I'm orderly, see the laws of gravitation, see the laws of physics, see the laws of chemistry, see the laws of light. And I'll give you another lesson. You're made for me. Every human creature has been made for me. And never think you've been made for this earth while you're here for a while. Oh, when I created you, Joseph and Mary, I searched around, as it were, to find out the poorest material which I could discover. Instead of making something almost indestructible for your flesh, I chose this compound of chemistry that's the weakest thing we have on the face Instead of placing stainless steel for your bones, I give you this crumbly substance. Instead of having diamonds for teeth, instead of giving you even a hope of lasting here a thousand years, ten thousand years, I cut you from the beginning that your course and life is short. I taught that intentionally and I burdened you with the seal of death in order that you will grasp the hand of life beyond the way. You go further than that. I'd like to take hours on that subject. I love it. But there's another point to this nature of God. If there is a God, and there is, because we can prove it metaphysically. You know the old argument of causation? You take a piece of paper and you tear it. Fine. Tear it again, fine. Subject all the torn parts to the candle and it goes into carbon and other chemicals. And you ask yourself the philosophic question, what's the cause of destruction? And you come to the conclusion, nothing can be destroyed, disintegrated, taken apart, made oxygen, made hydrogen, made carbon. Nothing can be taken apart that's not material. Only the material can be taken apart. Because there's not one material on the face of the earth, even though our chemists are actively otherwise, that's not an integrated whole, made up of something else, 
Men dat had dat een dat tante Jouwse. Too small for the human eye to perceive. When I was a boy studying the elements of chemistry, we didn't know one one thousand of what you done. So, God, causation, you can't take them apart, therefore he must be spiritual. Causation, come back to that, whatever is has had a cause. But you can't go right in for an item back until you come to a final cause. The final cause must have preceded everything else, and consequently, that which precedes everything else is God because he couldn't give what he didn't have. If we have intellect, God has intellect. If we have will, God has will. If we have persona, God has persona. That's simple metaphysics. But come to this other subject. If there is a God, a creator, there are also, because he's good, creatures. Now, we're the highest creature on the face of the earth who are visible. There are millions of spirits about whom we can't see, apprehend, comprehend. But uh, we're talking about the visible. What religion? Where does religion begin? Religion began in all eternity when God made the first persona. When God made the first creature. Even before persona, he did that. Because religion, in its old Greek sense, means the creature's relation to the creator. That's the big generic definition. The big generic definition. Come down to more specific definitions. The creature's relation to God, the dog, by being a good dog and doing the things of a dog is practicing his religion. The bird, by flying, by singing, by nesting, practicing its religion. The rain, by fructifying the earth, practicing its religion. Whatever acts according to its nature, implanted in it by God, is practicing its religion the creature's relation to God. Now you and myself, we have intellect and will. Because we have intellect, because we have will, yes, we have to practice religion too. With our intellect and with our will. Primarily, which brings me to another Louvainism. What religion is Religion is either primary or secondary. Primary religion is man's relation to God. Secondary religion is man's relation to his fellow creatures, particularly to his fellow man. Well, the Jews had that concept. You see on the Decalogue and the Ten Commandments given to Moses, Three were on one side of the list, and seven were on the other side of the The first three, man's relations to God, the other, man's relations to his fellow. You see that? Primary religion. Well, what's wrong with religion today? Now I'm on to a third subject. What's wrong with religion today? Well, I've watched very closely the finger of time turning over the pages of history. I've watched the early Christian religionists, and they were by no means the first in the world, nor were the Jews the first in the world, nor were the Medes, nor were the Persians. How long has man been on earth is a moot question. Could be a hundred thousand years, could be a hundred million years, for all I know, no one can contradict me, and I dare not say that I'm right. We just don't know. Let's be honest. But ever since men were on the face of the earth, they practiced some religion. 
long before the Jewish record tells the prophecies of the coming of Christ. Long before that. Maybe hundreds of millions of years before that. Religion didn't begin with the Jews. Didn't begin with the history that we know. Didn't begin with this planet Earth. Necessarily. We don't know. But we do say that primary and secondary religion means that as far as we're concerned, it's our relation to God with our intellect and with our will particularly. And the intellect and the will are conspicuous for their two chief actions. The little ten-cent Baltimore Catechism had the story when it said, what's the purpose of man's existence on earth? And the answer was given, to know, love, and serve God. That's as old as man, that answer. That wasn't excogitated by the fathers of the church in America. That's as old as God. And our first duty in practicing religion is to study God. And our second duty is to study loving God. You can't love what you don't know. You know, how often times do you go to church? Sunday after Sunday. When did you hear the last sermon on God? There's a question for you. There's a question that should bother the bishops of America. You hear sermons on liturgy, sermons on sociology, sermons on this and that and everything, but when have you heard a series of discussions on the nature of God? And you ask, what's wrong with Christianity today? Because they've taken the first tablet of the stone given to Moses and broken them, and are emphasizing only the seven other commandments. Man's relation to his fellow man. That began back in the fourth century in the year 325 at the Council of Nicaea, when the unfortunate Pope Pius of Art had given the emperor the right to help nominate the bishops in the Catholic Church. Because Constantine had said he would free them from the Catholic. It was a high price they paid for their liberty. And as a result, whom did they appoint? They appointed patricians whose fathers believed in slavery, in the Gallic. They appointed young men who believed in the patrician class. They appointed young men who believed in the imperial class and colonization. They employed as young men who were brought up in the palace. And we never got over that. And as a result, by the year 325, 80% of the bishops of the Catholic Church, according to Cardinal Newman and his two books on Athanasius and the Arians, 80% had become heretics, disbelieving in the divinity of Jesus Christ. Follow it all down the century. Pelagianism soon came, shortly following that. And what is Pelagianism? It is the effort on the part of 70% of the bishops, according to the same Cardinal Newman, according to Hilaire Bullock, who had studied this question at length, 70% had become Pelagians. And as Hillary said, they were becoming Pelagians again today. Simply for the reason, you know what Pelagianism is? You don't need the grace of God. I believe in the perfectibility of the human race without God. And if you don't believe in the grace of God, let's be logical for a moment as we divert. You don't need the sacraments, which are the fountains of grace. And secondly, you don't need Christ, who is the author of grace. 
And thirdly, you have to deny original sin and all sin. If you accept the perfectibility of the human race without God. Logical? What's wrong with religion today? We're infiltrated with Arianism again, disbelieving in the divinity of Christ. We're impregnated with Pelagianism again as we believe in the perfectibility of man who through his United Nations, for example, can stop war. Who through his medical centers can stop disease. Who through his sociological classes can stop race hatred. Love is a gift of God entailing grace. And without Christ and his grace, here I'm away beyond my subject. You can't have anything worthwhile. But coming back again, what's wrong with religion today? As I say, we destroyed the first tablet of the Ten Commandments. We don't recognize it. And as I say again, we find the last too many of our up-and-coming Catholics believing that sociology is more important than theology. They believe fighting for civil rights. I'm all for that. But they don't believe in fighting for God's rights. The poor victim in the garden of Gethsemane as he bled there and sweated there there. He could have called down legions of angels to protect him and give him his rights. He says, no, I shan't. He says, let it happen. And did you ever see a person in civil rights so trampled as in your situation? No stinking fire. Victimized by lies. Handcuffed. By grit. Civil rights. If he fought for his civil rights, there would have been no power. But if he fought for his civil rights, there would have been no resurrection from the dead. And no one could tell us that we too were right. I'm not a king civil rights, but my God, the great things in life for the Catholic Church other than civil rights, the God's life. God's life. He created us. He has the power to demand the life. You know that. You know that. And until we Catholics, until we Christians get rid of our Addiction to Palladianism and our addiction to heaven and begin to put God first and foremost as a proper object of religion. There's nothing left but more to take. We've lost Europe as Christians, and we've lost Asia as Christians. We've lost Africa as Christians. We're well on our way to losing the Caribbean and South America as Christians. And we stand back here in this country that's running a patient population. 200 million population within five years. And we have not kept it. But we listen, listen, listen those miscreants in economy fears and sociological fears who tell us we must have birth control, for example, when they don't even pause to know that by a pressing of a button at Houston, Texas, we could turn on enough sweet water to amaze a garden of Arizona. Mexico, Texas, that old Mexico, a greater garden of product.
distributing on all the Midwestern states have put together. Starvation. The only thing that's being starved in this country is the intellect and the will of those who are given a chance to know a God without whom we can do nothing. Take nothing for granted. Nothing. These are the days of contact. These are the days of disillusionment. And there's greater struggle for you and for me, even in my old age, to emplace God upon his throne again than there was ever occasion to do so when religion, practice, change at the time of feudalism. And saw our bishops and popes and priests become engaged in civilian affairs too much at the expense of becoming engaged in God's affairs. But God has told us 